Halt, our um, century is to call it das Spiele Seculum, the century of play. And he observed that people who were religious practitioners, practitioners all of a sudden started to introduce game mechanics into religious practice. That the composers like Kirnberger, Bach, Mozart, Haydn, they all introduced um, ludic methods for composition. So there were these famous uh, musical dice games, but also musical card games, where you would play a, a game of cards, and then the music was composed from that. Or uh, another hundred years later, uh, Mark Twain designed a learning game because he found out that his daughter always forgot the dates when the British kings were um, crowned and <laughs> died, and so he made this memory builder game where you had to put little uh, sticks into this um, um, spatial um, organization of, of history. So in my eyes, um, gamification did not at all start in 1911 when these uh, kind of overhyped um, definitions of gamification came up and made it very, very popular and everybody said it will be a big market, but they started much earlier. And what I want to do now is I want to analyze a little bit more carefully um, what this gamification could be considered to be. Um, I'm working at the gamification lab uh, in the Center for Digital Cultures in Lüneburg, that is a little town in between Hamburg and Berlin. And Paolo is my colleague there, Paolo Rufino. And what we do, we um, research games and try to um, find an approach that we call rethinking gamification. This is our team, Niklas Schrape, Sonja Fisek from uh, Poland, who worked with Helen Kennedy in Wales, uh, Fabrizio Portrinieri from Sao Paulo, Paolo and Lale Torabi, the designer. And what we uh, try to do at the moment is to rethink gamification. And what I want to show you is one example of another approach towards gamification, that's Daphne Dragona, called uh, counter gamification. And you might have heard about this game. It's a game that the Berlin-based autonomous uh, rebels or the anarchists um, created. It's called Come Over, and it's a game to destroy surveillance cameras in Berlin subways and in Berlin uh, S-Bahn trains. You will see that it clearly follows the... Uh, oops, how can I start this? this now. <coughs> I wanted to show you this movie, but somehow... Is it the one we have a should I just leave the open show for a second and just play it this way? So you can see here that Come Over is a game that has a system of rules. It has all ingredients of a gamified system like points, badges, um, and it creates the loyalty of the players increase the loyalty of the players by having them awarded if they destroy cameras. This is our Iron Lady, the German Iron <laughs> Lady, whom they want to uh, fight against. She says there are things that you should not dispute, you should do them. And that is their uh, way of their, their kind of mo uh, motivation. They say, well, we create a game where you have to destroy as many uh, video cameras in um, subway stations and on subway trains as you can. And this will be a competition. You will be awarded points for each camera that you destroy. And there will be a winner in the end who gets a prize. So this is clearly a game. It has a, a starting point. It has an end point. It has uh, even levels that you can uh, go through. Um, you can exchange information with other players about the most effective ways to get these uh, video uh, cameras down, either by um, sealing them with spray cans or by <laughs> using direct physical force. And um, you also have a web page that shows the 
what you call it, the, the, the counter of how good you are. So you can log in, they suggest that you should uh, invent a, a name like um, Rosa Luxemburg or Thälmann, <laughs> so not present your real identity. And then you could compete with the others. And if you see that your friend maybe has destroyed three cameras last night, you would the next night go out and try to, to destroy more cameras than, than, than he did. The first prize is that you get the first a place in the first row of a protest against police violence. <laughs> Next month in Berlin. So that, that's the, the winner gets this position in the manifestation. How do you verify what, whether you destroyed a camera? What happens if you have? How, how, how do you show that you have done it? Is that through video evidence? Yeah, you would have to take a photo from, from your mobile phone yeah. and then have to upload uh, this, this photo of a destroyed camera. Mm -hmm. And that's the evidence that you really did it. But the moment you get your prize, aren't you arrested at the same time? You can go this way. So th this is one of the examples that Daphne Dragona uh, calls counter gamification. But she also offers some hints that there could be different ways of um, opposing uh, uh, commercial gamification. And the, the, the different threats that one could take would either be this um, counter um, uh, counter gamification as political action, or there could be something like rhetorical uh, counter gamification, where you um, make fun of the notions of gamification. That is, for example, what Ian Bogus did with Carl Clicker, that he used the vocabulary and the lingo of the gamification prophets, but um, framed it in an absurd situation, so it became rather critical of gamification. Uh, than uh, promoting it. Uh, you see uh, now. I, I want to look at a few images that uh, are on the street, almost like with a Birmingham cartoon <laughs> studies <laughs> to point of how does society of uh, 2014 think that the relationship of work <coughs> and play um, his stage, and I also want to go to different uh, cultures and, and continue with you in looking for more images and more texts on, on this relationship. For the ideological papers of the management, uh, it often appears that they want to promote the idea that work is um, a game and that work can be fun, it can be this guy is staged like um, energetic, uh, powerful, uh, young, successful man, and he has a sports device there. Is it rugby or is it American football? Right? American football uh, ball in his hand, and at the same time, of course, he makes a lot of money. So they say this juego and trabajo uh, relationship is one where these two things can come together. There can be a unity of work and of play. There are other examples that go in the direction of Al Gore's suggestion that games are the new normal and everything must be games. This is a, a shot I took yesterday in a, a Berlin subway. I think it's an international campaign. Maybe you have seen the same poster in, in Manchester. Game on or game over. It means <laughs> basically you, you buy the Adidas sneakers and you uh, young, beautiful, sexy, and uh, ludic, or y y forget it. <laughs> you have to go to another planet. And that is what um, Flavius Dugan calls ludictatura or ludictatorship. Um, but there are also still uh, notions where uh, 
in, in, in daily life culture, uh, people suggest there is a difference of work and of play, and they don't uh, go together. Interestingly, this is from Metabo, from these electric drills. They say, work, don't play. So they, they create a strict opposition. But uh, what I'm interested in is that these two ideas, um, trabajo e juego, and the other one, work, don't play, somehow um, reflect the um, conflict that the school of Marcel Mons and Bataille had on one side, and Adorno Habermas and Walter Benjamin had on the other side. What Bataille thought, and he was in, uh, strongly influenced by Marcel Mauss, and uh, Marcel Mauss's book Le Don, the, the present, from the 1924-25 years, was that Bataille thought that there could be one strong um, agent that would oppose the capitalist system and the slavery of um, uh, fun uh, functionalist logic, and that would be the gift. But the gift was for him not something like uh, something you would exchange with some, somebody and then get it back, but it was an excessive uh, gift, uh, like um, the abundance of giving away. And his favorite example was potlash, where um, people in certain cultures, they had um, rituals of um, giving away that became so excessive that they often ruined themselves or the whole tribe. So they gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and gave and, gave and did not expect that anyone would give back. But Thay says also, if you give something it's, and it's a real uh, dom, then you do not expect someone to give it back to you. So it would not be this kind of domesticated form of gifts that we have in our society for Valentine days <laughs> or other occurrences where you expect that, that somebody gives almost the same thing back. But one of my experience that I make is when I go to birthday parties with my son, then people are very, very careful that the, the birthday gift that I give to the, the, to the one uh, five-year-old almost equals in value what they give to my son. They would be completely embarrassed if I if, uh, would they, uh, give their son a complete horse or something. But the next birthday you get back one Lego ninja, so don't worry. <laughs> and this is not what I thought a gift is, but I would have said so that is, again, um, the curse of uh, the exchange of e equal um, commodities, e equally um, valuable commodities. And for Bataille, then, this idea arose. Bataille was also very close to the surrealists and personal friend, but also um, intellectually following their lines, was that he thought if we could establish something like a culture of giving freely, without thinking of whether we get something back, we could create a counterbalance to capitalist uh, exchange system. And Bataille um, was also um, influenced by Singer, and Adorno, on the other hand, um, took a completely different stance. He said what Huizinga um, never really understood was that um, play is not something that uh, is situated extra capitalism, but it is an after image of unfree labor. That, that is how he coined it. A Nachbild unfreier Arbeit. And he came to the, he arrived at this thought by reading Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin um, wrote uh, an essay about Baudelaire, a book about Baudelaire in 1930. When was it, 33, 34, something like that, in the 30s. And um, Walter Benjamin observed um, gamblers and players in Paris and looked at them and went to, uh, to the casinos but also to private um, playrooms. And he found out that the way that um, gamblers work very much resembles the way that factory workers in a uh, were, um, act in, in a factory. He says, on, in both cases, they are alienated from their 
from the system that, that they are involved in because they cannot make the rules. The rules are imposed upon them. So the factory worker has to follow certain shifts and he has to produce a number of items. It's the same thing for, for people who work in the casino. They have to, to follow the rules. They cannot break the rules. And in so far, they just um, are caught in something that he calls the Fron des Spielers, the drudgery of the gambler, the drudgery of the player. And Adorno then picked this up and he said, yeah, I mean, Adorno was anyway a bit of a, a stiff character. <laughs> but he got all, all of what, what is in playfulness and in, 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 in a ludic attitude. But he had the same feeling. He looked at people who played, and he said, well, they just uh, work like factory workers. They're, they're, they're just, uh, uh, what you can see with them is this Nachbild uh, Unfreiheit, this after image of um, unfree labor. And I think these two schools, on one side uh, Maus Partei, on the other side Adorno, um, Benjamin, also Habermas, they are still going around in our heads when we see these adverts or when we um, react to certain plans and utopias and dystopias. On one hand, we would like to hope what Bataille said, that by playing and by excessively giving and uh, losing control, we can emancipate from uh, the drudgery of capitalism. But on the other hand, we maybe often have this fear that uh, Adorno, Habermas, and, and Benjamin had that um, in the end you cannot, cannot do that because play and gaming uh, contains so many aspects of um, the organization of labor and of our society and is kind of stuck in that. And that is my, um, maybe the point where I would Go back to what uh, Just Reisen said this, this morning with these Deleuzean <coughs> Fluchtlinien or these lines of flight. I think that the, the, the lines of flight are not something that immediately makes the whole system collapse or uh, creates a, a total revolution, but they're very singular, particular, maybe individual ways of dealing with an oppressive situation and just finding this little uh, line of flight and hoping that then something changes in the end. But Deleuze seems for me to be somewhere in between these two. He shares the hope of uh, <coughs> Batai and of most, but he also is aware of that, that there is a problem that he cannot kind of completely turn it around in one second. And um, maybe at this point I would like to um, start uh, discussing this with you of what you find or what, your, what, what you can see in your culture as um, being common sense or being an utopia of the relationship of work and play. And I start with uh, Proverb from the super stiff German cultural environment, <laughs> which says, Erst die Arbeit, dann das Spiel, nach der Reise kommt das Ziel. First you work, and then you play. Because only after the voyage you arrive at your goal. <coughs> so this is, this is a, an opposite statement, and very much in, in German. Um, um, and Protestant mentality that you have to work hard and then maybe you can play uh, later. But then there are other proverbs, of course, which, which say the opposite. There are proverbs in other cultures that say that the process of traveling is, or you are in the process of traveling, you are already at your final destination. That is the, the opposite thing. You cannot just travel and then arrive at something. Beautiful. So I, I would like to ask you: Can you think of um, proverbs or lit quotes from literature from, from, from your cultural <coughs> environment that define the relationship of, of work and play. Do you have something in, in, in 
the, okay. the devil will, the devil makes work for idle hands. Let, let me write these down. <laughs> <laughs> the devil does what? The devil the devil makes work for idle hands. The devil makes work and then for idle hands. Ah, okay, oh, right. I see. Is there some Chilean? Yeah, <laughs> Chilean. Chilean? Yeah. It's fine, it's like when the wheel, the wheel, when the trabajo, trabajo. Ah, when you work, you, when you yeah, work, you work. But it needs some context, it's very cryptic. Basically, in Chilean, we have one word that can be used to say anything. It's just one word. And it's huevo. And huevo means egg. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a good word because it comes from referring to uh, main. <laughs> when you use it as a verb, so when you use it as a verb, it's hueveo, which is a messy. But it's, as a noun, it's like hueva. So we can say anything with just one word. And we say, we have this saying that is basically, cuando hueveo, hueveo, when I mess, I mess. Cuando trabajo, trabajo. When I work, I work. Yeah. There's actually, there's actually one in German. Yeah, please. <laughs> so good. There's, there's something a little bit similar in German also, which, which goes... Um, let, me, let me think. Dienst is Dienst and Schnaps is Schnaps. So it means um, your... Um, when you have to work in an office, you have to work. When you drink, you, you have to drink the booze. And this means that you cannot mix up fun and work. They, they don't go together. <laughs> There's a little bit also um, the, the, the notion that Habermas had. Habermas wrote after the war, a little bit later than uh, Adorno and, and much later than Benjamin, that he said, and now after the war we have discovered that if there was ever a possibility that work and play could go together, it is it's forever lost. Mm -hmm. That was the, the Second World War, and the Holocaust. Point. That was, was his reaction on that. And in the same spirit, uh, Adorno um, uttered this famous phrase that he said, "Nach Auschwitz kann man keine Literatur mehr schreiben," which which um, translates into, "After the Holocaust and Auschwitz, you're not able to write poems anymore." And what he meant by that was not the kind of uh, process of writing something that rhymes. Adorno would of course think that that would still be possible, but he thought that the uh, um, positive and, and sophist and, and, and hopeful spirit of writing poetry was impossible after such a horrible thing. I've got one as well. All I kept being quoted to me at work. Uh, years ago, then. All work and no play makes Jack a dull thought. All work and. I had to look back to make sure that it existed outside of my own head. Uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yeah. Makes Jack a, a dull boy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if all you're doing is working, then you become boring. A dull. dull. Ah, sorry. A dull boy. <laughs> That's the kind of rhetoric. <laughs> it's from The Shining. Yeah. Hmm? From the film The Shining. Is it? Thank you. Yeah. No, no, wait, pre yeah, yeah, yeah. It just gets repeated yes. a lot. Yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> cultural English, is that like? Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. easy. Yeah. I can remember my mother saying it to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, which is why I wasn't sure it existed at the time before. Yeah. Yeah. There's another one called Work, Rest and Play is Mars. Yeah. Work, Rest and Play. Mars a day helps you work with your life. And that is? Work, rest, and play. Play means, I don't know, yeah, yeah. activity. Ah, okay. okay. It's an advertising it's slogan yeah. for ah, a chocolate yeah. bar called Mars, yeah. which is a miles a day, ah. which you work, rest, and play. Yeah. Okay. And it's basically code for that's what it's on sugar in. Yeah. In day schools, we learned that today is eight hours work, eight hours uh, play, and eight hours rest. 
Cloud provider. The day is eight in our future. The word Western plane is yeah. the same. And does, doesn't that stem from the campaign for constrained working hours in the 19th century? There was, I, I don't know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the UK there was something around this eight hours, eight hours, eight hours division that was around the campaign to short to live work. Don't don't take Christmas Eve, meaning like don't be sneaky to get your own interest in really like Don't play Christmas Eve. Yeah, don't play Christmas Eve. Don't like I have spotted that you're trying to get your own interest in. The white person seems by the way. Because Christmas games and then that's what the king wants to have. So I'm going to say that I'm going to do that. During the period, the period. I also have the feeling that this eight hours, eight hours, eight hours refers to the development of the workers. Probably. Yeah, that's what we were discussing. Maybe I just remember it from when I was a kid. So that was the there's also the American one of work hard, play hard, which is, which is kind of always curious because it's a sort of like injecting a work ethos into play. Yeah, like yeah. As if it's yeah. like you outperform even when you're not working. There is also a connotation with that work hard, play hard, that depends. I mean, it's used in Australia all the time as well, like to people who are sort of extreme, extreme sports or like massive drug taking culture. So mm -hmm. it's got that kind of association as well, I think. It's, it's funny actually, one of the probably the least playful cultures I've been in is like team sports. Where, you know, any sort of playfulness is really looked down upon. You have to be serious and help everyone out and you know, work for the collective. Any sort of individual play. Is that the case? Yeah. Are team sports mm -hmm. the least? Yeah, which are really supposed to be play, but... Um, but con conversely, in very serious situations such as conflict and war, I mean, I can recall uh, I fought in a very brutal war, and my colleagues would gain five more experience in terms of motives on their helmets, in terms of marks on their planes, in terms of kills, and it was to try and deal with it. So at the extreme end, where you are in a very serious situation, yeah. you can play or gamify, if you want to use that expression, with that kind of experience. And what, so what were these marks on the helmet? Are you thinking of this bit fire? Well, no, I, I was thinking my, my own experience, and, and that was. was Basically, it's called crossbones for kills on your helmet. Mm. You would pay them on, and mm. then you would all, and who sounds rather callous now, whoever had the most skull and crossbones on the hel helmet, bought the beers when we got to Port Stanley. Mm. That's what we did. Mm. Is this still a practice in the military that you I, try I, to get Maybe somebody's newer in the military, it's 30 years since I left, but um, mm. I'm sure that it is. Mm. Uh, and yet it's an extreme opposite of what you think is serious play. And, uh, and I, I was a keen sportsman in team play and you recognise what you said was very, very serious. <coughs> yet in extreme, extremely serious circumstances we play. Mm. Now, it's helmet camp, it? yeah. now it's helmet camps, isn't it? That's the... Uh, I, I, yeah, the, just... What Squatty's in Afghanistan seems to be all doing is, is filming the experience. Yeah, and, and that, maybe, uh, yeah maybe that, that's what it is. Of, of, of distancing and playing back. Yeah. Mm. But it is a form of play you know, to deal with a very extreme form of circumstance. Don't hate the play, I hate the game. <laughs> Ice tea's and stuff. I think it's alright. Yeah. <laughs> I got two Italian ones. Italian, yes. yes. Very good. Exactly. Uh, yeah. um, one is um, Il bel gioco dura poco. Il bel gioco. Yeah, please. I mean, it's like a nice game should not last too long. <laughs> <laughs> and the it's against like World of Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. It applies to governments as well. Yeah, that's true. It's the same. Ten more. Yeah, okay. And then, well, Jockey di mano, Jockey da Pidolano. 
which means yeah, if you if you play with your hands, uh, you're, you're probably only an impolite person would play with hands. But like if it's a physical game, uh, it's probably a game of uh, someone who's not very really educated. Game of hands. Oh, we have the same one. And so it's like you know games where you're kind of slot people. The sort of things are for running people. So I don't know. I guess they kind of put games into a context. Context. So they're only good as long as they are. You know. What is this a nice game should not last long? What does it want them to tell us? That, uh, what is the message? It's it's like well, if if it's a nice game, if it's a nice joke, uh, you should have like it's a beginning and a clear end. Yeah. That that makes it nice and appropriate. Otherwise, if it keeps going for too long, it stops being nice, it stops being enjoyable, it becomes very annoying. Yeah. Well, then uh, you know, obviously, then uh, you know, you know, yeah, inappropriate. So yeah, it's like saying if it, if it's if it's a nice joke, a nice game should be you know, should end quite quite soon. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I don't find that others in mind, but. I would quite like to uh, continue collecting these things. So if you don't mind, I would like to send you emails after this meeting and maybe build up something like a repository of proverbs and farmer's wisdom. <laughs> Farmers and workers wisdom. So he would also, I think, on one hand, I'm interested in um, do different uh, cultures uh, have different notions of how these two go together? So could there be something that could be peel out something like a Mediterranean spirit or jumping <laughs> stiffness from, from this. The other thing that I'm interested in is whether, whether this has changed over time. So whether there are certain conflicts that would reappear and reappear and reappear or whether there are something like a conjunctur of, of certain thoughts or certain ideas. But I think it would also be good um, to have um, extra European cultures because I'm so, I, just a comment uh, that this kind of distinction between kind of play and, and, and games. I, I I think you know there are kind of similarities in, in the 1970s and 1980s. They developed the, the kind of area of study of leisure studies, and uh, leisure uh -huh. studies went through a lot of these kind of debates between what is leisure and what is work, and trying to define distinctions between leisure and, and work. And actually the the title I gave you, the, the Devil Makes Work, is actually a title of a leisure studies book, taking kind of neo-Marxist approach to leisure, and making uh -huh. the same kind of like, developed very much at the Birmingham School, the Devil Makes Work okay. book, okay. making that kind of argument, the kind of same kind of Marxist arguments, but uh, taking a more kind of general view of kind of what is leisure, as opposed to kind of play. But I see a lot of kind of similarities in early leisure studies. Do you remember the title of the book that you referred to? It is called The, the Devil May Ah, it is called like this. Yeah, yeah, The, ah. the Devil May <coughs> okay. Yeah. Are there other um, comments or questions? Oh, the Devil May's work. Uh, I want to go back to your theory, because um, mm. I'm very interested in these thinkers. Um, I do wonder to what extent there is opposed as you seem to be presenting the mess. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've read, uh, read anything that Alan Badiou has been saying about the doorman particularly. Um, but Badiou has a very interesting opinion of the doorman. And um, particularly with regard to the doorman's focus on the negative and the critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think um, there is this emphasis on stuff which isn't there. Yeah. And that's in fact I too. And that might be worth thinking about because there's, I, I think, I mean, this is interesting. It's, it's interesting to get different perspectives on, on you know, different cultural perspectives. But there, there, it strikes me that there's going to be some phenomenological um, ground that's common, mm -hmm. not just concerning play, but also work. And, and of course, the Thai thing is, well, it's not just work, that it's the economy. Um, yeah. And very few economists know about this. Kind of, there's, there's an interesting space to play with. Yeah, and would you? But you would not say that Batai is something like a negative dialectics. He's not. No, but I think what he says about waste 
Uh, and actually what Roger Kelwa, who was his mate, what he was saying yeah. about waste and play, I think that there's, there's a strong uh, theme of the negative in, in Vataille as well. Mm -hmm. Um, now, but I does different things with it, but it's, it's kind of, they're pointing, I think they're pointing to the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think uh, Paul, it was also an, an idea of yours that one should look into this uh, KOR Bataille connection and the surrealist. Yeah, sure. And, yeah, so that's one ongoing project. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, yeah, I think, I guess it's like the, um, it's a topic of rationalization, right? So it's uh, the idea of, of, of games to be a perfectly rational system. That you're kind of, you can kind of look at games as, as rational systems, most particularly video games. Uh, but then, particularly also the counter gamification idea by Daphne and Dragon is kind of trying to also look at ways of outside of this kind of uh, narrative of rationalism and trying to. to uh, get back to an idea of games as pure enjoyment and, and yeah, I, I think I think I think it could be our discourse, which is the problem here. It's not it's not the phenomena. It's the discourse. It's what the tools that we've got for talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Are we making distinction between games and play there? And what we're not saying in terms of the rational approach. Is playing yeah. So those distinctions yeah. between play and game games that, that I think games are rationalist. Mm -hmm. I don't think play necessarily is. Yeah. We had a discussion with um, yeah. some 10 Brazilian artists with us recently and one of the, the th questions was what's the difference between playing and games. Yeah. And I think the closest we got that nobody agreed with but that was a, a question is, is um, do games have a win state? Do games have a lose fail? win situation, whereas play can be something as open-ended. That was the closest we well, could. Yeah, as a whole. So play is more of a behaviour, whereas game is more of a kind of a construct, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think for yeah, that yeah, 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 you can rip that apart, yeah. but it's just an interesting yeah. situation. I'd would not have split these things up, because in German you say spiel for both right. yeah. play and game. So for him it was very much, when he was thinking in German. Yeah. But Cal, I would. Yeah, yeah, Cal, I would. Make a clear distinction. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting, otherwise, it is, but apart from um, this book about games, which is actually where, where he kind of revisit some of his earlier ideas, I think the young Kerouac was much yeah. more interesting. That yeah. That's where he, he thinks this idea of uh, evolution and, uh, and, and mimicry and mimetism as uh, purely rational behaviors, and it shows how these are actually often even uh, suicidal behaviors. Yeah. Uh, they're absolutely. Mm -hmm. The idea of rationalism is actually kind of given by this sort of act of interpretation, which is a mostly a human interpretation. So this, the, the, that 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 Kelwa was actually very interesting because he was uh, countering this idea of uh, uh, living beings as um, uh, rational beings or tending towards a form of rationality. So we're showing how this actually doesn't really happen. But, it, but again, no, sorry, we don't know. But, but then he talks about vertigo, yeah, as one well of the, the play states. And vertigo is it's not rational in any sense yeah. of the So, no, um, one minute. Yeah, please. Um, so, I'm thinking whether Marcel Mauss's concept of gifts can allow you to escape the logic of exchange. Because um, you could see it as a form of, of course, symbolic capital. So the giving of a gift demonstrates that one has um, the means by which to purchase this mm -hmm. gift, and then to um, thereby acquire a form of symbolic capital over the recipients. And even in instances of potlatch, where the, the giver might not have the economic means to give the gift, but then they might still demonstrate this gusto and assumption to show that I'm willing to suffer the consequences of being broke and mm -hmm. to give this gift, then it still um, shows these qualities and for evidence in these qualities. And there's an onus surely placed on the recipient to in some way reciprocate or demonstrate some other array of qualities rather than to do nothing, which maybe shows a form of powerlessness. So where would self-sacrifice fit in that scheme? Um, no, I was just thinking about self-sacrifice when you don't have 
the economic means to actually give the gifts, mm-hmm. but you end up, you know, going bankrupt, or you know, your example of pot thatch, mm-hmm. then that shows that not necessarily you have the means, but you have the kind of will to do something. Yeah. Well, we all have that, don't we? Well, the the recipient is then placed in a kind of difficult position of having to maybe go bankrupt themselves to return the gift or mm-hmm. to not do that, which then shows they don't have the guts to do that. Mm-hmm. Just wondering what your thoughts might be on that. I have the feeling that for both time, if you, you would not have thought that you cannot escape. I think he, he was presenting some hope that you can escape. The sort of the exchange impression. Mm-hmm. And I think your idea with it's interesting that your idea with this um so then the focus becomes the body on the material. material. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. a material commodity, which is exchanged or given. I, I think you would have a problem with the rationalization. Which is his argument is basically that the rational economic um, way of thinking was actually built on a whole sort of web of taboos and um, very deep um, uh, primordial um, issues that actually we use rationality to brush over. This is why, I mean, this is his most important work is about sex. And, and, and he really he uses that as the foundation for creating this sort of theory of economics, really. Um, and it's a theory of rationality. Um, so I, I think I think what he would say is, is something about the rationality, about the way we rationalise behaviour. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. Okay, I think this is a kind of you know, difficult time. We have to call it a quick um, <laughs> lunch. I'm hungry. So. <laughs> I'd just like to thank Matthias for a fascinating thing. <laughs> Lunch has been served downstairs with the coffee wine. Um, I